today, we are really um, delighted to have one of the foremost experts uh, discover of Ebola and, and also a, a lot of research in AIDS, uh, extensive experience in public health. And uh, we're, we are eager to look uh, to hear from uh, Professor P Peter. Uh, Peter, can you just give us a start, um, uh, give us a summary? When we had the discussion about a week ago uh, with the experts from uh, Berkeley, as well as uh, Professor uh, Fukuta here at Hong Kong U, every week yes. the situation changes. And it isn't just little changes, sometimes dramatic changes. And one of the major changes uh, from just yesterday was the WHO declaring uh, COVID-19 as an epidemic. And I know there are stuff also happening in, in, in London, in UK, where you're based. So can you just give us a quick summary of, you know, COVID-19 right now uh, as of today? Yeah, thanks, Alex. And uh, I just want like like to say that I'm a big fan of the Asia Society. I've uh, visited you in Hong Kong, but also in other places in the world. So that's a, so really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you're right. I mean, every day is different when it comes to uh, COVID-19. Maybe the, well, first of all, declaring a pandemic, frankly, doesn't make much difference. Uh, we all knew it was a pandemic before WHO declared it a pandemic. And, uh, uh, but I hope it will also, um, you know, increase awareness that this is a really major global crisis that we're facing. Secondly, uh, whereas initially this was considered a China problem, it's definitely no longer a China problem. Uh, it, ironically, now um, many of the cases uh, that are found in, in China are actually imported from other countries. And, um, that shows that uh, one blaming one country doesn't, you know, help and is uh, is unfair. Um, but also that there's now kind of an equalization of risk, and for example, total travel bans and so on uh, are no longer, you know, uh, make sense because the virus is everywhere. Um, in also in Europe, where since we're here in Europe, uh, we can Italy shows how fast. Uh, the situation can change. If we would have had this conversation two weeks ago, uh, you know, I may not have even mentioned Italy, or let's say certainly three weeks ago. And now it has the third largest number of cases in the world after China and Iran. Um, and it's even a lockdown. Uh, here in the UK, um, I think the, uh, again, the virus is present here. It's no longer uh, something that is imported, that comes from abroad. Um, and uh, uh, I think the government here is uh, very active. Uh, we had yesterday the, the Chancellor of Exeter uh, announced the 12 billion pounds uh, special measures um, for uh, to deal with, uh, you know, coronavirus. And we can come back to that. But also, um, we are now discussing whether uh, containment, pure containment, uh, as the only strategy, whether that's really, um, you know. The only thing we should do, and today, uh, COBRA, this is a um, uh, the National Security Crisis Committee uh, chaired by the Prime Minister. They're meeting today, and, and it's anticipated that um, we will go to a containment plus, um, you know, delay type of uh, strategy. Uh, so that will be that will be discussed this later on today in in London. Yes, yes. And so, Good morning, London now. Yeah. So, can you now also um, kind of talk a bit about um, uh, social distancing? Uh, one of the things that I'm I'm particularly um, uh, interested in because here in Hong Kong, uh, when we started this program uh, February 14, um, a very different world then, and it, it, social distancing is something in Hong Kong we've been practicing. Um, and um, I have to say, uh, personally, social distancing sucks. Uh, no concerts, uh, no, uh, uh, the museums have been closed. Um, uh, only recently has the, um, the uh, government offices reopened uh, and we're still not functioning, you know, fully uh, uh, on, you know, nine to five schedule. So in terms of what you are seeing, uh, what the other countries are doing, I know in the U.S., um, it, you know, it's a big deal when they uh, postpone or cancel the St. Patrick's Day parade in, in New York. And also um, there's been talk, uh, uh, NBA games have been canceled. And, and it sounds like um, uh, UK is going that route. 
So in terms of the success of social distancing, um, what grade would you give um, Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, which is slightly, they're practicing it differently, but also what China has done? Um, I guess social distancing works? Or yeah, not? I think, yeah, I, I think that uh, China has shown that it works. Um, certainly in Hubei province, when you see the uh, now the major decline, and, uh, and as I said, uh, more and more of the cases are no longer indigenous cases, but are imported cases. So there's a clear impact. Um, the question is whether um, a complete lockdown, like and, and for a long time in, in, in China, um, how feasible that is in other countries uh, and in democracies, for example. I don't think that will be uh, possible, like in uh, Italy has now, um, you know, uh, launched it in Denmark. But, you know, social distancing is, is not just the closing down events and schools and so on, just maybe a little bit as a joke, but it's, it is correct. There's already a lot of social distancing in normal times in Britain. People don't shake hands. You know, uh, it's not like Japan with greeting, but it's uh, there is a um, that that may make it a bit easier than cultures where handshaking and hugging and so on is far more common. Like, I mean, another extreme example, I would say, is, is Brazil, where when you meet someone, even if you don't know them, they, they kind of uh, already go over your whole body and so on. But besides that, I think there are gradients. For example, closing schools, this controversy, with, because we don't know what, uh, uh, what, how, what the role that children are playing in, in uh, coronavirus transmission. It's very clear that that was very important for and is important for influenza control. Um, you know, um, but uh, one thing that we are concerned about here, for example, is if we close down the schools, who's going to take care of the kids? It may be grandparents. And grandparents, by definition, are older, more right. vulnerable. And so maybe we make it worse. So we, we have to, the jury is still out. But I think we, here we're going to, um, in terms of social distancing, um, in not a ban uh, as in the US or in other countries. I think that I don't expect that. But I think there will be uh, particularly uh, concentrating on two things. One is that uh, more working from home and, um, you know, uh, avoiding um, yeah, major uh, big events in, indoor particularly. But secondly, protecting the elderly and the most vulnerable, because that's also uh, an issue, not only for the, the tragedy of a death in the family and the person, but also for uh, the health services. Um, because the, the National Health Service here already in normal times, that normal, just a seasonal flu, um, is at full, full capacity when it, for its intensive care beds. And if we see an influx of lots of patients, as we're seeing in Italy, they can't cope with it. Or, so that's a, delaying is really the, the, the way to go, but we should not give up containment. But once you have lots and lots of um, cases, with lots and lots of contacts, there's simply no capacity to do all the contact tracing and all that. Um, in uh, prior to this uh, interview, I uh, saw your interview with Talks at GS um, uh, on February 21st, and in it you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, a possible relapse. You know, it, well, for China, as people are going back to work, uh, uh, it, you know, after the Chinese New Year holiday. And also, we just, I just saw in uh, SCMP, uh, uh, South China Morning Post, the Canton Fair, the Chinese government has decided that it was going to go ahead with it for mid-April to early May. So are you uh, concerned that, you know, um, China is, is it, would, there is a possibility of slipping back to, to uh, uh, you know, I know China has done a good job and so on and so forth, but are they you know, the Canton Fair opening and, and maybe the government is now relaxing some of these social distancing. Are you concerned about some of those uh, efforts uh, that maybe here in Asia, we've been ahead of the curve, that uh, some of the, uh, that we, we might be doing stuff, uh, opening stuff too quickly? Um, and, or are, do you think we're on the, possibly on the right track? Well, first of all, I think that the world should be grateful to China, you know, for, uh, you know, these draconian measures which in a sense delayed the spread of, um, you know, of coronavirus uh, throughout the world. Now, the question with these things is how long 
is this sustainable? Because we're also a society where we need, you know, the economy needs to go, we need education and so on. So it's going to be a trade-off. And um, so gradual reopening of uh, manufacturing, of schools and so on, is unavoidable. I mean, we can't continue to, uh, you know, to have everything closed and, and, and society come to a standstill until the last case of uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, is either dead or, uh, you know, is cured or, or survives. It. And um, so that's a trade-off. And so, but I think uh, it is going to be unavoidable that uh, when um, there are, you know, this reopening of, of factories, of businesses, uh, that there will be probably a second way. But I'm quite optimistic, at least for China and for you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, you know, and particularly you and, and Singapore, you've done an exemplary vote. I think it's probably the best program in the world. Um, that um, it will be not as dramatic as the first wave because people are now, um, you know, you adopt certain behaviors. There is social distancing. I'm sure there will be all kinds of measures. But we can't continue forever. And um, one thing that I advise to policymakers in so on is, so, okay, when you declare the social distancing or bans on this and that, what's the exit strategy? For how long? You have to think that one through. Because it is also not only the uncertainty about the virus and about what it can do and so on, but also uncertainty of how long are these measures going to take. And, um, and that influences a lot. Um, you know, confidence of people um, and, uh, you know, and even the stock market and so on. It's, it's a duration that is a, is a very important uh, point. In a, uh, I think you, uh, last September, in an interview you did with Telegraph, uh, you mentioned that, quote, I didn't fully appreciate the social, behavioral, political, cultural contact that these um, uh, epidemic thrives in. Uh, what do you think hinders our fight for of the epidemic, um, how does the lack of trust uh, kind of take place? Uh, it, you know, it plays into the spreading of the virus. I think you mentioned in other interviews about the the, the um, social media and and uh, fake news. And you know, what can some of the solutions uh, from scientists, politicians, and citizens here in Hong Kong? Last week we talked about um, you know as as great a, a, a have we've done here in terms of containing. But Hong Kong, as you know, um, we've suffered a lack of uh, social cohesion these last couple of months. So how do you think, um, you know, kind of the lessons from this, um, uh, it, you know, the importance of social cohesion, um, are, are, are the politicians aware of this? And, and uh, um, are they playing into the fear uh, in, in some cases? Yeah, no, I, I, it's something indeed that I learned uh, actually the hard way, but already many years ago when I first worked on Ebola, this was in 1976, you know, I'm an old man. So, and that's when we, uh, that was the first known Ebola outbreak. And, uh, um, you know, and, and Ebola is not like, um, you know, COVID-19. It's actually not as transmissible. You need very close contact, no respiratory transmission. So anyway, however, um, what's key is uh, trust. If people don't trust uh, what comes out of the government or experts and, uh, you know, it won't work. And particularly in our times of social media, before uh, all the information came, newspaper, radio, then TV, and that's, that's it. Could be far more uh, controlled sometimes, although here in Britain we have tabloid press, we should not underestimate that what they can spread as fake news. Um, but now in today's world, it's it's very difficult. And, uh, uh, and I've been wondering indeed in... Uh, uh, in Hong Kong with uh, what's been going on over the last year, uh, how people, the public would react in case of an epidemic. It's actually something, uh, I was in Taiwan in, uh, in December and we were talking about that and then I was in Hong Kong and I said, if something happens here in epidemic, we didn't know about uh, COVID-19. But in the end, you know, I think that uh, it, it is working out uh, quite well um, from, from a distance. Um, but communication and openness and transparency. If people believe that the government or the authorities or public health also are covering up something or are, you know, are not transparent in the information, I think that could be counterproductive. And we've seen that over 
already uh, at the, in the early days in in, in Ubay, you know, in, in Wuhan, um, and uh, then you lose so much credit that your measures um, won't become effective. And it's very interesting to see that the World Health Organization, and also here in the in the UK, that we've set up a um, monitoring of all the news and the fake news about, um, for example, therapies or uh, how to protect yourself, um, and that's circulating. Uh, plus, also, um, what we're seeing here um, is very unfortunate, is racism and, and, and xenophobic attacks. Like here at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, today we have a, a whole session uh, with uh, colleagues who are of a Chinese ethnic origin, including some from Hong Kong, and uh, who will talk about their experience. Uh, of course, that racism is always there, but now it's coming up. Um, so, so we need to, uh, to work on many fronts. And dealing with epidemics, I always say, it's not just a medical affair. Okay, that's, a, in essence, the easier part. I mean, it's, I have to organize it, but it's uh, communication, 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 good coordination, and logistics, making sure all the things are there. So that's where we are. Thank you. I, I think what you've touched upon is something that Asia Society here we will uh, be exploring is really this, um, uh, it, the racism we're hearing about um, is almost global. I think we've, uh, there's been violence and there's been, uh, yeah. my worries is now it's uh, the, the, um, the spread is now in the, you know, both COVID-19 and also the xenophobic, the, the racism is also being spread in, in um, Chinatowns throughout the world. And, and it's yes. really unfortunate. So there's a, it's a topic that I know Asia Society um, um, locally and globally will be um, talking about. And now with some of the questions that we've gotten uh, from our um, uh, audience, the uh, uh, social media audience, um, one of the questions that I wanted to pose to you um, is, what is your estimate of how much residual transmission there will be in major mainland Chinese cities uh, when industrial production capacity fully resumes? Well, let's look at the figures. Uh, even in the worst affected province in, in China, in the Wuhan province, um, depending on what the, the actual figures will be, but uh, between um, 0.01 and maybe 1% at the most of the population have been infected. So that's at the most one in a hundred. And um, officially it's much less, but I think many cases are still not detected or we're, we're asymptomatic. That means that probably that well out of nine out of 10 people, if not more, um, did not get infected. And in other words, are still susceptible and could become infected. Um, so there is a, um, a still a major threat, but um, again, you can't continue forever to, you know, to stop social life. I mean, there won't be any food. There won't be, we can't survive. Um, so I don't think it, that means that everybody will become infected, but it means that when factories are reopened, schools, uh, you know, uh, businesses, uh, et cetera, events, that we need to, uh, you know, to continue to have the discipline of some kind of social distancing. And, um, and but I think the, um, Everybody is now much better prepared. Just as Hong Kong and Singapore, you benefited actually from the traumatic SARS experience. Very much. Unfortunately, you haven't forgotten that because often uh, I always think, you know, never miss a good crisis in the sense that as long as we, you know, learn from the crisis, then that's an opportunity and that with the next crisis, we do a better job. And I think that's what's happening and you benefit from that. Um, and so in that sense, we can be more optimistic, but I don't think it's realistic to think that the virus will not rebound or that uh, it will go away. Um, what, we have one question from the audience uh, online. What is the situation like in the UK right now? Uh, and what are the concerns for the, uh, the British most? I mean, this is really interesting in this post-Brexit UK. What is the situation there now? Well, in the UK, we, as everywhere, we had initial uh, cases imported from, uh, you know, came from China, from uh, well, from Singapore, uh, and then mostly Italy has been the major source of infection. However, now they're spread in the community. 
in, in, in the UK. It's still very limited as far as we know. Um, testing has only started to be widely available quite recently, but it's far more available than in the US, which is a big country. And um, the, uh, the awareness is, is, is quite big. Um, we are um, fortunate to have uh, a system of chief, chief scientist, chief medical officer, chief government scientist, and the policy is very, very informed by, by science and, and not necessarily totally by politics. Uh, that's the good news. Um, I'm worried about a coordination with the EU because in Europe, frankly, there are no borders. I mean, even if Britain is an island, we is the Eurostar and some people come and go. Uh, so it's important this close coordination. And Louis Michel, um, sorry, Charles Michel, the, um, the president of the uh, European Union has um, had a, a special um, you know, uh, meetings with all the heads of state and heads of government. And now uh, all the ministers of health are uh, have daily contact on this to harmonize the policies. Um, because people live in one country, work in the other country, I mean, like you have also, frankly, um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's so much mobility. And not, and the, 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 the um, how to say, the policies have been very different. For example, Italy, I mentioned, uh, was the first country very early on to ban all flights to China. Ironically, now it's the worst affected country. It didn't work. I mean, and because the reality also is, when you think of it, it's one case is enough. One person who, you know, starts all this, and it may have started with one person, the whole epidemic, you know. Um, I think a lot about that, for example, as I dealt a lot with HIV, which is also came out of the blue um, last century. And uh, it may have started with one person, and in the meantime, 75 million people have become infected. Can, it, it's mind-blowing, yeah? what it can do. Uh, so I think in, in the coordination with the EU, I hope will be will continue despite Brexit, just as we need strong collaboration in terms of security in general, but also health security and a few other things, food security. Um, and so I hope it won't be captured by the politics of Brexit and on either side. Um, can you, in light of what you just said about Italy, can you comment on what... Uh... President Trump just declared today in terms of the 30-day uh, travel ban from uh, countries from Europe, except UK. And, and that I don't quite understand, but that was just uh, declared this, uh, this morning here, uh, we, we heard. So do you think that's going to be effective? Um, because I know in the United States, I think the coast, there were some clusters of it. Um, is that a political maneuver or is it a practical? Uh, does it, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, is, scientifically, does it make sense? Well, we were all very surprised. I mean, uh, I, I found out also when I woke up. And um, first of all, uh, let's not forget, there is transmission within the United States. Even if nobody is allowed to go in and out of the country, um, you know, the virus is continued to spread. And the U.S. has only tested about 1,500 people. The whole country uh, until last week, um, and uh, which is far, far less than an insufficient compared to any European country. Um, so, and, and as I mentioned, take Italy, it banned all flights to China, and yet this was at the time when China was the source of infection. Um, thirdly, uh, it's interesting that uh, this ban applies to foreigners, but US citizens can come. It's not that US citizens have some natural immunity. Uh, against you know, I'm married to an American, uh, so I, you know, I'm quite familiar with it. But this, so I think it's, uh, you know, I don't can't imagine that this will have any beneficial um, impact on the spread of, uh, you know, COVID-19 in uh, in the U.S. So, yeah, and and it's uh, and it doesn't make sense that uh, it's only the countries of the Schengen uh, Agreement, so the where you have a free circulation of people. And that includes also Switzerland and Norway, uh, who are not members of the EU, but Ireland and UK, and I think Croatia and uh, Bulgaria, I think, or Romania, they're not part of Schengen. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't, uh, I don't see the rationale and uh, 
I, I can't imagine that the scientific advisors, uh, the heads of Center for Disease Control or the National Institute of Health, um, that they have advised the president to do that. Um, but there are all the surprises with uh, President Trump, so we'll see. But it, uh, I, from a scientific epidemiological perspective, it doesn't make sense. Frankly, as I mentioned, when um, all cases or nearly all cases were concentrated in one country, I mean, one province, it did make absolute sense to have a travel ban and uh, strong restrictions. But today, uh, you know, this kind of equalizing of risk. In other countries, Israel, it's also banning basically everybody. India suspended all um, electronic visas. Um, I, you know, I, my concern is now if everybody, if every country is going to do this, uh, it will make the uh, fight against uh, coronavirus even more difficult and the economic downturn will even be wor worse without really contributing to um, bring this epidemic under control. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the testing and, uh, and, you know, Korea has really done a great job in terms of testing yeah. really quickly. Um, and yeah. uh, of course, the, the numbers spike, but they seem to be, um, they are no longer a top three, they're number four now, uh, in terms yeah. of the cases. So early detection uh, really is a seems to be a key to containing this epidemic. Uh, would you have any advice uh, to hospital authorities or governments when implementing measures like um, uh, infection control in hospitals and uh, in, in, in that? Yeah, early detection is really important. I mean, it's no coincidence that the title of my memoir about the you know, first Ebola outbreak in the AIDS is called No Time to Lose. Because in, um, when this contagion, because this is about contagion, uh, if you can intervene early on, you prevent not only uh, the, the first generation of people got infected, but many, many generations and maybe even millions. Now, in terms, so I think that Korea is doing a great job. We need more tests. And um, we, at some point, the tests become, how to say, uh, pretty uh, irrelevant if there are hundreds of thousands of cases you know, you assume anybody who has a respiratory infection has it and so on. But at the moment, we don't know enough and we need to test also to find out the people who are asymptomatic carriers because they could transmit the virus. And people want to know also. Uh, and for hospitals also, it's really important uh, because they need to uh, see who to admit and uh, who to put in intensive care, who to isolate and all that. So... Uh, I would say, yeah, testing is one thing. And also the UK now has, um, how do I say, relaxed uh, recommendations for testing. So before you needed not only to have symptoms, but also have a history of COVID, um to one of the affected countries. That uh, history is no longer necessary, again, because it's transmission here. Now, but again, you know, the experience from SARS is really important. Korea is not so much SARS, but MERS. They had quite a few deaths from another coronavirus infection coming from the Middle East. And, um, but key, I mean, this very simple things that go back to the 19th century, hand washing is so important. And people may not think about it because they say, oh, it's a respiratory transmission. But, you know, we touch our eyes, our nose and so on. And, uh, and it is, that's really key, but that's good for hospital hygiene in general. What is important though for the, any health system is that there are today that there are enough respirators, oxygen, uh, you know, um, that, uh, that the healthcare workers themselves don't get infected. And let's not forget that they're often the first, the, the front line, the first line, and many get infected. Um, that's not only a drama, many have died already or several, uh, but that means also that um, there will be fewer healthcare workers to deal with uh, a surge in patients. So I think that um, um, we're going to uh, a situation where this will be a test, a real test for and a stress test for many, um, you know, health systems. And at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, one of our concerns are the poorest countries, low-income countries, some in Southeast Asia or in Africa with weak health systems. Um, when um, COVID-19 is really... Um, you know, uh, exploding there, 
uh, that's going to be absolutely catastrophic. Um, then I kind of last week we talked about um, this article that uh, Bill Gates wrote for the New England Journal of Medicine about responding to COVID-19. And his concern was the lower, low and middle income countries. Um, yes. And you have work in these areas uh, with Ebola and all that. Are you concerned uh, that not enough um, uh, resources or uh, is, is, is committed to this right now? I think it seems to me this particular virus uh, really hits um, uh, this part of the world. China, whether it's developed or developing, but China cope with it. And, and then uh, certain countries have coped with it in, in different degrees. But do you think um, the, the next, uh, you know, is it going to hit, hit uh, uh, the LMICs? And are you concerned um, uh, being, you know, more familiar with the, the public health service of these countries? Um, how are they going to deal with it? I know there's been money uh, that the Gates Foundation have made a donation of $100 million initially. So how do you think, um, you know, tell... Yeah, that the LMICs. Are you concerned? Yeah, very concerned. And as I mentioned for our school here, the London School of Hygiene, that's a priority. We provide support to other countries, also in Asia. But um, Africa is actually our priority now, also because half of our staff are based there. So we have good relations. And um, the first, um, there was there is the issue that there are over a million Chinese living now in, in Africa. So there's a, a lot of connection and there are five daily flights from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to uh, a city in, in China and that has continued. So there, there are lots of Africans going to China for business, for study. So there is that connection. Even if now um, maybe China is less of a uh, concern in terms of a source of infection, but the first cases have been um, reported and we are um, in a situation where they're very uh, poor and, uh, yeah, literally poor, but also um, insufficient uh, health services like hospitals, uh, intensive care units. So that means that uh, once the uh, virus is there and people are infected, that mortality is probably going to be much higher because mortality depends, of course, in whether you have underlying conditions and so on. And sometimes it's the weakest uh, of us who will die, of course, but also the number of respirators, the, um, you know, the intensive care that you can provide so that people get over this uh, critical period of total uh, respiratory distress and so on. And then also the uh, health, public health systems of uh, laboratory infrastructure, uh, contact tracer is very weak. However, the good news is that, um, particularly since the West Africa Ebola outbreak in 2014, which killed 11,000 people in three countries, that has been a wake-up call. And several countries have really, uh, you know, created the Centers for Disease Control, like Nigeria is a really good one. Um, very important also, uh, there's now a, an Africa Centers for Disease Control uh, under the aegis of the uh, African Union. So. It's, it's not there yet, it's not uh, perfect, but we're in better shape than five years ago. But here, the, my major concern is the impact on health services that are really uh, very underfunded. So the lesson is that we must invest in uh, these systems in between epidemics. We, we behave in the world a bit like we would have a fire brigade uh, that's only set up when the house is on fire. And when, the, and when it's over, we just send everybody home. No, we need that fire brigade all the time, and we all hope it will never uh, have a job to do. Good point. Um, one of the questions I want to kind of talk to, uh, ask you about right now is really about um, the, what are some of the tools uh, at our disposal to fight against the COVID-19 uh, I know there's talk of vaccine, um, you know, it's still going to be probably a year or so away. Um, you know, do you think there is sufficient investment uh, that is being made uh, right now in prevention uh, in, for future epidemics? Yeah, first of all, the tools we have today are very, very limited. I mean, they're not different from the Middle Ages, frankly. I mean, it's isolation, uh, contact tracing, and then uh, isolating the contacts. Um, public education, hand washing, again, not very sophisticated technology, and uh, 
and then providing care for those who are, uh, you know, uh, critically ill. Um, so, but that's in contrast to influenza, the flu, because the influenza still killed more people per year than, uh, than COVID-19. But there, the big difference is we have a vaccine, even if people don't always take it, but we have a vaccine, we can do it. In the case of COVID-19, um, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that very soon we'll have uh, effective therapies. There are lots of clinical trials going on with um, existing uh, anti that can be used to treat, for example, HIV infection or Ebola, uh, and uh, they can be what we call repurposed. So they're being tested now in trials, in, particularly in China, uh, but now also increasingly in other countries. And that, frankly, we should know what are we know. Like, and I think in April already, uh, we should have an idea of what works and not, and then make sure it's available. Vaccine development, very important, but um, we have to be um, realistic. There is, the good news is lots of investments. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, and I'm a founding board member of it, has issued eight contracts to companies and universities to um, develop uh, this vaccine. So, um, but um, uh, you know, it's going to take, as you said, a year, maybe 18 months before a vaccine is really available for people because it has to be tested. One, we don't even know for sure that a vaccine is possible. That's why you need to do all the research. Let's not forget that for HIV infection, we've been working on a vaccine for 35 years. I mean, we, the world community, and we still don't have one. So it's not always certain that it is possible. So we need to do the test. We need to make sure that the vaccine is not only effective, but also that it's absolutely safe. Uh, and that takes uh, you no know, long time. It has to be tested. There are no shortcuts you can take. So I think for all practical purposes, for the current wave of this epidemic, uh, a vaccine is not going to be uh, available. However, it's highly likely that this virus will be with us and will circulate in the world, you know, forever maybe. Um, and that we need, then we would have a vaccine uh, for the next, um, let's call like the next flu season. Um, that that is what the, the hope is there. So, but there's good investment in it, uh, but it's extraordinarily uh, expensive. Developing a vaccine costs about 500 to 1 billion US dollars for one vaccine, and then you have to think also about manufacturing. We need like a billion or more of uh, vaccine doses. That's not something you can make overnight. You even have to construct special factories. You have to be commissioned. There's no contamination, it's safe and all that. So uh, there have been statements in the media uh, by some scientists though, we'll have a vaccine in a few months. Um, I, I'm very sorry to say that's not gonna happen. Um, we have a question from uh, the social media audience. Uh, the question says, is COVID-19 the disease X? Uh, the unknown pathogens that the WHO has been flagged as a priority. Is this disease X? Yeah, it, yes and no. I mean, um, it is disease X in the sense that that was made for, or the term was created for a new virus, and particularly a virus that is respiratory transmitted. Um, and um, that's X. But we've had new viruses emerging, um, and you just see in my short life, you know, from Ebola, I was involved with that was HIV, we had SARS, we had MERS, and we had uh, a few others. Um, so it will always happen. And um, the, the worst case um, disease X or virus X would be um, transmissibility as, um, you know, the SARS-CoV-2, as it's called, the virus that causes COVID-19, this coronavirus, but with a mortality then like of SARS. Or uh, worst would be, a uh, nightmare would be uh, an Ebola that is uh, transmitted, respiratory uh, transmitted. So that's, um, so it can always get worse. But I think we are, um, this is not um, a drill, this is a, the real thing. And uh, particularly the, uh, uh, not only the uncertainty, but the potential for millions and millions of people to become infected and even with a, fairly low um, death rate, um, it's still going to kill tens of thousands of people. But again, we've been there before because we have influenza um, 
you know, uh, flus, that influenza viruses that change and that can also cause major epidemics. Like in 2009, we have the swine flu, H1N1, which killed about 300,000 people in the world. But interestingly, that was not such uh, hot news as it is now, uh, you know, with COVID-19. Um, one other question uh, that I have is, you were uh, the founding executive director of the UN uh, AIDS and undersecretary general of the U United Nation, uh, I guess, 95 to 2008. How far do you think we've come in terms of international collaborations in combating uh, epidemics such as uh, uh, HIV and, and things like this? Um, can, we do, can we do more in terms of further strengthening um, our response during this uh, time of crisis? Yeah, I think HIV is a good illustration of something that started with the first report uh, about, uh, didn't even have the, the name AIDS yet, uh, was from California. I think it was uh, seven or nine gay men with a mysterious pneumonia also started, but of a different kind. And then cumulatively, 75 million people have become infected. Who would have thought that that would be possible? It's an, it, it just illustrates how things can evolve. Uh, um, but um, yeah, I think we've made good progress uh, in, in terms of uh, international collaboration. Um, when I compare the response to uh, COVID-19 and SARS, it was much faster, more transparent. Um, the, the virus was isolated in early January and already the, you know, on the 9th of January, the sequence of the virus was you know, shared with other scientists. They immediately started working diagnostic tests uh, etc. So that sense the world is a bit of a paradox. On the one hand, we've got populist movements and nationalistic type of reflexes with, uh, and some of the travel bans are based on that. And on the other hand, there's really good um, international collaboration. However, where we have not done enough, I would say, is, um, you know, is invest in preparedness. Uh, my point that I made earlier, let's make sure that after each crisis that we better prepared and we do a better job. I think the worst is not to have a crisis. Nobody planned for this um, and you can't prevent um, these uh, outbreaks from, from happening. Um, but let's make sure that we are better, you know, uh, prepared and we've learned the lessons. And sometimes I feel that when this, something is no long, longer headline news, uh, you know, there are so many other priorities in life and for a government that we neglect this preparedness. And that's, I think, I hope what will come out and that we need a bit more, um, you know, investment, particularly in the countries that are, um, you know, poor, um, less well organized for, you know, historic reasons. Uh, they need support and build up the, you know, the their systems. And that's what we call, you know, then global health security. Um, in your book, um, AIDS Between Science um, and Politics, uh, you mentioned that what's, quote, science does little good when it operates independently of politics um, and economics. And politics is worthless if it um, uh, rejects scientific evidence and respect for human rights. Um, how do you think in this situation scientists uh, should interact with politicians? And um, because I think it, you, you mentioned the AIDS is such an interesting topic as well in terms of the political uh, back, yeah. backdrop that it brought, especially in the United States, uh, as I remember with uh, the Reagan administration. Um, and, you know, in times like this, I really respect, I mean, I've always respected scientists, I think a, a man of learning. But in times like this, you know, we especially appreciate it because you see them on front line battling, uh, um, you know, the, the virus itself, but sometimes also battling, uh, battling for what is truth. So how do you think scientists, you know, right now in this situation, um, how can scientists and politicians work together? Well, I'm impressed you read all my books. In the, in the, but, yeah, you know, I learned this the hard way again. I mean, I came into the, um, you know, the AIDS response from uh, an academic background, scientific background, as a clinician to patients. And I thought, okay, if we have the facts, you know, things will be organized. But then we were confronted with a lot of stigma, denial uh, in, in, in many, many countries. And um, so I said, okay, we can have the best 
uh, discoveries and the best knowledge, but if either society rejects it, we talked about that before, or if there's no political leadership, it's not going to happen. There won't be budgets and so on. And on the other hand, you know, that uh, on the other extreme is that um, I was confronted with uh, uh, the situation in South Africa where then President Mbeki, um, you know, denied that uh, uh, HIV existed or that AIDS was caused by it. And that delayed enormously the response. So I think it's really important that uh, we scientists, we communicate, we get out of our ivory tower um, and uh, uh, we inform. We sh we're not in charge. I mean, that's the, the job of politicians. I must say that the UK has a really great system of chief scientists, chief scientific um, advisors in each department, plus the government uh, sci chief scientist. We have a chief medical officer. And I must say the, um, the policies here are uh, very, very well informed by scientific evidence. And we also, uh, like here at our school, um, you know, we have media training. I really encourage our scientists to, uh, to learn how to communicate without using uh, acronyms that nobody understands and, and hermetic language. That's a bit of our problem. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really very, very um, committed to this kind of uh, coalition, if you want. This is the kind of things where we need everybody. We need politicians and political leaders, absolutely. We need a scientist. We need the communicators. And, uh, you know, and I said always that journalists can save more lives than, than, than scientists sometimes, as long as the reporting is accurate. And also uh, in today's world, and it's the people, of course, and the, and the social media. Um, and uh, you can't control all that, but I think um, scientists still have uh, high credibility in, um, you know, uh, in, in many societies. As long as we are not going to be like self-serving, I, you know, um, make a statement and say, "Come on, give me the money to uh, to pursue my hobby," and because that also happens. No, I think the reason I ask this question, um, I think in during this time mm. of uh, uh, social distancing, a lot of us has been uh, watching Netflix, and the one particular uh, show that one of my colleagues recommended, and that I had a chance to to watch it uh, during this time because there is nothing we can do. There is no museums, no concerts, so on. <laughs> Has been the, the, the film, a uh, uh, document, uh, I say a document series, Chernobyl. And it's really the struggle between the scientists and the political party and what is truth. So in terms of the yeah. storytelling, I think the role of scientists, um, you know, is, is really important. I think, uh, you know, their, their research and so on. So I, I, that's another reason I've been so curious, uh, very interested in, in, in the views uh, from uh, your perspective. But one of the questions that we also have now in the audience of, uh, is that, um, about, is there, uh, it's asking about, is there a meeting, and you mentioned some of the health experts in UK, is there any meetings of the health experts in the UK? And what are some of the discussions surrounding that you guys are all discussing uh, on on, uh, uh, on COVID nineteen or uh, other uh, epidemic that you are concerned about. Yeah, first of all, I think that one of the jobs of the scientists is always to, uh, to speak truth to power, and um, but that's not always welcome, and we've seen that uh, you know uh, in China, for example, and uh, and in the history of AIDS, and, and 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 it's yeah, there is an inherent tension because often we come with very uh, unpleasant news, you know. Um, but here in the UK, yes, there are several um, advisory groups of scientists uh, to the government. Uh, for example, um, here at our school, uh, we, are, uh, we have very strong uh, mathematical modeling groups. You know, about, uh, we have about 25 mathematical modelers full time working on, um, you know, on, on uh, COVID-19. And frankly, I don't have even the time to, to watch anything. We are, we are nonstop working. And, um, the uh, so what do they, what are they doing? They're trying to figure out um, what's the trajectory, uh, how long is this going to last? Uh, what's the peak? What are the needs in terms of beds in intensive care units? Who does airport screening and fever? Does it work? Uh, and we know, for example, that one third of people don't have fever, so you will you'll miss them by that. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. But I mean, we have to be realistic. Um, closing schools. Um, you know, social distancing, what does it mean? So that kind of uh, um, discussions are there. Um, a lot are 
um, you know, virtual over Zoom and so on. Um, we have then groups dealing with therapeutics, uh, vaccine group. Uh, here at our school, we have a weekly meeting of a um, COVID-19 uh, task force where we exchange information uh, and also with colleagues from all over the world. And so uh, fortunately, we have today, we have, um, you know, all this uh, video technology that we can have just as we do now. Uh, even in uh, 2003 with the SARS, this was not very well developed, you know, it was, uh, you know, we didn't have Zoom and FaceTime and so uh, it was kind of a bit of magic that you could see someone you talked to. Uh, and not to mention even the time of the Spanish flu. Um, so now this communication is much more uh, developed and that's good so we can work so working from home. But it's a, there is really great collaboration uh, at this stage uh, between and among scientists. Uh, of, you know, there's a bit of competition also, but I think that's, that's healthy. There's no problem. Uh, and across borders, I would say. We have, uh, for example, we have regular contact with Hong Kong. You know, by the way, Hong Kong University was founded by the same person as the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, Sir Patrick Manson, but before us. So that's why we consider HKU as our big system. Um, and uh, there's a big Manson building, and uh, he started the uh, what was called Hong Kong Medical College for the Chinese. And, uh, and then a few years later, he's, he founded our uh, school. So we have lots of uh, interactions. and. Uh, you have some of the best scientists in this field. And maybe people in Hong Kong don't always appreciate that, but I can tell you from, as an outsider that that's the case. Well, thank you for that, because that was one of the reasons we started this uh, um, webcast, uh, because we know here in Hong Kong what happened 17 years ago with SARS, and also even before that, 1916, uh, when Pasteur was here. So Hong Kong, when it comes to infectious diseases, has a history of, of uh, you know, being there. Uh, in fact, we have a, most people do not know, we have this really uh, little medical science museum near Hong Kong U that really chronicles some of the history of these uh, early uh, infectious diseases yeah. that Hong Kong has played a role. And that was another reason that we felt it was very important for Asia Society Hong Kong to take the lead. And we've been so gratifying that we've been able to talk to scientists like yourself uh, and really scientists from all over to really ask the question directly of you. Um, so that, uh, and, and you're right, the technology has en enabled us to do this. And we've been able to put together a program like this fairly quickly. And last week we did it in three time zones. And this time we're, we're you're here, you're in London. And you know, it's really, we're very delighted. And we really wanna thank you uh, for taking part and helping us with this discussion. But before I let you go, we do have one final question from this part of the world. And I, I don't know if you are, um, if, if, well, two questions and, and uh, travel related. What will be the trigger for the general public to be able to resume traveling again? Um, how should we protect ourselves when we travel on planes? They're starting with the last part, it's a bit more better. Uh, it's probably safer to um, travel in a plane than take the, the tube, the underground here in, um, in London, and the reason is that uh, the air in planes is uh, recirculated through so-called HEPA filters, and they filter out um, certainly bacteria. Depends on the type of uh, filter, so that is uh, something that um, you know uh, it's it's not absolute, and you can still become infected, particularly for you know your neighbor and so on. Um, so, but I I think that um, the um, the risk assessment is such that. Personally, I will continue to travel. However, uh, the question is a very, very relevant one for many respects, and that is, when can we resume? And frankly, it's going to be a trade-off, again, um, and also between which countries. But it seems that at the moment, the mood is for more travel restriction, more travel ban, and um, we, I assume that once uh, the the number of cases is below a certain level that we can start again. But here, um, uh, I, I really think it's not going to be, how to say, pure science. This will be a combination of um, a bit of science, a bit of politics, and a bit of gut feeling. And, uh, and that's the reality. I think we shouldn't uh, make it more rational than it is. 
I guess the last question um, would be really the I, I, here in this part of the world, and we have colleagues in Japan, and people have been worried about you know maybe the the Olympics, and uh, but part of the question has been about the the heat. Uh, you know, will uh, when it gets warmer, um, is the virus going to go away? And that's been I've heard read things uh, of diff- both pluses and minuses. So, in your expert opinion, I mean, what do you think will happen in uh, July and August, and uh, will it impact uh, the Olympics in Tokyo? Well, first of all, we really don't know whether this is going to be seasonal, and when temperature is going up, there will be no transmission. I doubt it because uh, let's take Singapore, they're doing a great job, but they have also transmission there, and I, it, on the average, it's like uh, it's about 30 degrees uh, every day, uh, you know, uh, throughout the year. Um, so I wouldn't count on it, but who knows? It could be decreasing. Uh, as for the Olympics, I, this is a mega decision that's going to be very, very difficult. And um, let's hope that by July, uh, with all the measures in place, uh, it should be, you know, we should be really over, not only over the peak, but probably very low levels of transmission. But nothing is uh, sure. And, and it could be, uh, you know, what are we going to do if this virus is going to continue to circulate for years uh, before we have a vaccine? Uh, are we going to stop any sports activities? And so uh, Brazil faced a similar problem um, when four, four years ago, yeah, when there was the Zika epidemic, and, uh, and which was particularly concerned for pregnant women, because if you're pregnant and you're infected, then you can have a child with major, major, um, you know, neurological, um, you know, uh, deformations, including like a small head and so on. And there the advice was, okay, they went ahead. There were no major problems, uh, but uh, pregnant women were advised to stay away. In this case, it's not so, uh, you know, uh, how to say, it's not so specific in terms of groups. So, but it could we could imagine that you have Olympics, but where, for example, at uh, in the stadium, there's there's a seat in between every person. You, there there may be ways of managing it, but I'm not involved in these discussions. But um, what we're doing also more and more is that instead of canceling events, we make them virtual, and you can live stream, you can follow, you can follow a concert at home. I know it's not the same thing, uh, you know, uh, but that's the way to do it, and so. For example, I mentioned we have an event about racism and, you know, and uh, discrimination against the, you know, ethnic communities in China, uh, Chinese uh, here at our school. Well, we we decided it's so important. People need to know we want to have raise our voice. And what we're doing, it, a lot of this will be followed by people all over the city, maybe outside. And in the auditorium, we have space in between people who sit there. So. We, we are about, it's about minimizing the risk, but we cannot completely cancel the risk. That's the, otherwise, you know, we shouldn't even live. I mean, the, uh, we shouldn't also take a plane or whatever across the street. So as a society, this is also the time to think through what's the kind of risk that is acceptable and how to manage that. That's more of a philosophical consideration at the to end this conversation. But thank you. That is such a great way to end on because for an organization here, we we were traditionally doing our program live with people to people and not having to do that for the last two months, we have not stopped uh, impacting. In fact, I think uh, the initial number for a program like this was uh, 1,000 to 2,000 people viewing. And traditionally, uh, when we've had a successful program, we can only hit about 300 people. So we're really delighted and very uh, grateful to Professor Piat for uh, taking part uh, in this episode. And then stay tuned. Next week, episode six, uh, we will have Dr. Wilson Lam, uh, a doctor here at, in Hong Kong at a Glen Eagle uh, Hospital who is dealing yeah. with infectious diseases. So we're really delighted. And then episode seven, Professor Mark Lipstitch, Lipstitch at, uh, from Harvard, uh, T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health will be with us on uh, March, 20, uh, March 26. So we're delighted that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the technology has been able to uh, bring, uh, allow us to bring program like this. And again, it's my deepest gratitude uh, to, um, to the professor. And I look forward to welcoming him here. I think you're right. I think there is still 
Um, nothing like a face-to-face -face program. And, uh, and we will, anytime you're here in Hong Kong, we look forward to welcome you uh, to speak for us. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Good thank evening. Thank you, Alice. Real pleasure. And uh, I'll be back at the Asian Society. Thank you. We look forward to welcoming you then. Good night. Thank you, and look forward to join uh, for all of you to join us next week for our yeah. episode six.